In our series here in Colossians, we're talking about a really important topic, and that is, what is your mindset? And our minds are such a critically important battleground in our spiritual lives, and intentionally we have to set it, and if our mind is set on chaos, as it has often been through this last six months, then our life will be in chaos. And this, this picture it was really brought home to me in a story that I ran into this week. It's Scott Bolzon, and he was a, a player in the NFL. He was a fairly wealthy man, had lots of different enterprises, had had a full life, and then he had an unfortunate slip in the men's room and hit his head on something hard. And the ensuing concussion, he lost some of his memory, and the doctor kept assuring him that it would come back. But, but actually what had happened is a part of the, some blood had been cut off to a part of his brain and he absolutely lost 46 years of his life. He couldn't remember anything. He didn't recognize his wife. He, he didn't even understand what marriage was. Uh, he'd never heard of birthdays. He didn't know who the presidents were, didn't know anything about movies. He had completely wiped his history. And what happens is when you forget where you've come from, then you lose your identity, you lose your purpose, you lose your way. And I, and I say that, because I think all of us struggle with spiritual amnesia. And we're going to talk about how do you have a daily practice? How do you consistently reset your heart and your mind? I was talking with a friend about this, and they said, my mind is like a pinball machine. Like, man, even when I'm trying to like pray, boom, 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 my, my mind's jumping all over to all kinds of things. And if I, if I don't get right on it, it, whoom, point over, done. And I think all of us need this message. I think we need to get better at how do we set our hearts, set our minds. So let's look at Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 1. And he says, since then you've been raised with Christ. Since is like the word therefore. And, and it's actually Colossians and Ephesians are very similar. And the first part of Colossians, he talks about the majesty and wonder of Jesus. And then he talks about the incredible power of Jesus saving life and what what does it mean that he died on the cross for us and the, the whole gospel story? And now when you move to chapter 3 and 4, it's in light of those things. Now that you got that, here's the way it should play out in your life. Here's the application. So he says, since you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. He's kind of saying, here's what Jesus has done for you. Here's who Jesus is. Let me give you your, your picture that's so important. Now, here's your responsibility. You have to learn how to set your hearts and set your mind on Christ. Now, setting our mind, focusing our thoughts, clearly impact the decisions that we make for the day. And then he says, set your heart. And we often think of hearts as emotion, but really in the Scriptures, your mind has to do a lot with your thoughts and your heart has a lot to do with your choices and your motives. Not only what you do, but why you do it. And so how do you set those things? And again, we come back to what we've been reviewing the last several weeks, that the story of how Jesus has come to earth and his death on the cross and his resurrection and how that is reviewed in our lives, not just when we became a Christian some years ago, but every day we need that reminder that I am lost without Jesus, and by faith I trust that He will rescue me and His power is available. And we're going to talk about how do I do that on a regular basis. So I'm going to challenge you, and I'm going to try to help give you some ideas for how to spend some priority time with God. How to first of all set that time so that you can say, I am intentionally setting my heart and setting my mind on Jesus, on my history, on what He's done for me which then provides my identity. Now that tells me who I am, which then gives me purpose. And, and if you start your day like that, as opposed to turning on the news and seeing what craziness is going on in the world, it will change your life. In fact, I'm going to suggest you need to do it more than once a day. But the first part of having a priority time with God means that it needs to be a priority. It needs to be something that doesn't get knocked out of your schedule. And let me, let me tell you, it's not just like exercising or eating right or some other kinds of disciplines. It's a place where there's spiritual battle going on. Satan wants to knock you away from a relationship and a connection with Jesus any way he can. 
So there's all kinds of ways in which we need to prepare. So you need an intentional time and space. So let me say it this way. Setting your mind may start with setting your alarm clock. I, I believe that it's important to start the day off right. And usually that means that we've got to carve out some time in the morning, if at all possible. And I know not everybody's schedule is the same and you may work different schedules or you may have kids that get up a little very early or whatever. But if you can set apart at least 15 minutes to say, okay, God, this is our date. This is you and me and we're going to meet together and try to do it on a consistent basis um, so that you have a routine that's established. Try to have a place that's as much as possible free of interruptions uh, just, we are so distractible, that, that ping pong or that pinball thing. Uh, I remember Pastor Ed was trying to lead a very serious meeting. We were the elders and wives meeting together over at the coast at a beautiful place. And, and we were talking about the strategy, what God wanted us to do for the church. And, and I remember he made the mistake of we were all seated around this beautiful room that had a big picture window overlooking a, a beautiful lake and trees and stuff. And He's talking passionately about where we should go and what we should do. And all of a sudden, one person, who I'll let remain nameless, went, Eagle! <laughs> there had been an eagle flying by outside the window. Man, all of a sudden, everybody's looking, and people get up, and they start taking pictures. And it's like, you know, Ed just completely lost the whole group right there. And uh, that's not so funny, because that happens to me all the time. And even when I'm trying to focus my attention and I'm trying to, to spend time with God, man, my mind just goes boom, 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 boom all the time. And the only answer is you keep grabbing it by the horns and putting it back in. Okay, here's what I'm about. And I'm going to give you a couple of clues of maybe how to do that. But you should be, as much as possible, similar times, free from distraction. Get your Bible out. If you use the Version app, get your phone out or your iPad and have it sitting there so you don't just get doing everything else because that time gets used up so quickly. Then, as we talked about the spiritual pathway, let me, let me explain a little bit how I think this may fit into where you are in your spiritual development. When people first are seekers, maybe they, they first start reading the Bible for themselves, and that's a huge step of, of spiritual growth when you start doing it not because somebody told you to, but you start exploring the Bible for yourself. And, and hopefully, as you move into choosing to follow Jesus, you begin to learn how to make a habit of that. And it's sad that I've talked to Christians who've been Christians for years who, who still haven't done that. But establishing a time daily where you're spending time with Christ, and it doesn't mean that he's mad at you if you miss a day. It's not a legalistic thing. But if I find in my life, if I don't have some structure, things just get pushed out of the way. And unfortunately, the urgent takes over the, the things that are really in priority. And so you need to form a habit. And then as you move on in your spiritual development, I think you need to reform a habit. Maybe you start with a very simple version devotional and, and, or daily bread or something that's kind of bite-sized and maybe pretty simple. And hopefully as you grow and mature, you realize that you need to mature. And you get in your life group and you talk about some parts of the Scripture and Maybe you do a study on your own or you're involved in listening to messages or podcasts. You, you begin to dig in a little deeper. And then I find that after you've been a Christian for a long time, sometimes you can go from routine to rut and you can have been doing the same thing. And let me tell you, that kind of is, it works against the idea of a relationship. If, if I said exactly the same thing to my wife every morning, it doesn't really matter if it was good things I said. If it was always the same, it's no longer about relationship. It just becomes like check mark. I've done my duty. And so I would challenge you, even if you're a mature believer, that maybe you think about how do I refresh that? How do I make something different? How do I, I, I learn a new way to do it? This year I'm reading, uh, Jan and I are both reading through the Bible chronologically. We are reading it as it occurs on the timeline. And you may be surprised to know, people think it starts in Genesis at the beginning and it ends in Revelation at the end. But let me tell you, it is not on the same timeline all the way through there. So it's a different way of reading it. And you read Genesis and then you put Job in there, which isn't how you read it if you're reading through the way the order of the book. So it's a way to refresh that time. And sometimes I read a lot of chapters in the same day. Sometimes I read a paragraph. And somehow changing it up can kick that up and refreshen it. And so let me challenge you as we walk through this. 
to evaluate how is your time that you spend with God. If you don't do that, let me give you some ideas of how you could. If you've done that so regularly for so long, let me challenge you. Maybe you need to change a little bit. Maybe you need to refresh that time with God. And then, obviously, every part of our time of fixing our heart and fixing our mind on Christ has to involve the Scripture, that God has given us His Word to not only tell us about Himself, but it's like spiritual food for your soul. And so, whether you understand everything or not, it is feeding that Holy Spirit within you. It's feeding your spirit. And so he goes on down in verse 16. He says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Let let the things that you've learned in your head, let them sink down into your heart. Let it be something that you reflect on, that begins to to permeate so that you're marinating your, your heart in it and it starts changing your way of looking at the world. And and your way of responding to people. And it's, he says, I love that picture. Let, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. So he, he brings out the fact that, that your spiritual relationship is not a solo venture. That's why we challenge you to get into life groups because somehow by talking about the Scripture together, by talking about even your, your struggles with distraction, by, by sharing... It helps it dwell in you richly. And I, I, there was another version that said, may, may the word of God be at home in your heart. May, may it dwell richly. And obviously we've been talking about how the gospel, the good news about Jesus, the, the way that he's rescuing us. He not only rescued us in the past, he's rescuing us every day. And it says, let that dwell in you richly. And then he goes on and he says, through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So he says, spiritual music is a part of that focusing your heart and your mind. And, and there's something powerful about listening to praise music or maybe singing yourself. Maybe, maybe you compose songs. But that's a powerful medium and has been for thousands of years of connecting our heart to God. And part of it is, and it's interesting, it's one of the controversies in, in uh, Christian music today. It's like people who are more used to word-rich songs are frustrated with, man, you keep repeating that same phrase 47 times. And that's, I think, the purpose of both of those is to help us think about godly thoughts and to let them reflect in our, our awareness and our, our, our emotions and our, our exactly how it fits into our lives. And so he says, here's another way that you can use the scriptures, but maybe also worship music or maybe listening to a... a a podcast about a specific song or some way in which that then begins to help the Word of God uh, dwell in you richly. And then he says, with gratitude in your hearts. And that, that idea of instead of w- when I spend time with God, uh, too often we run in like unmannerly children. Dear God, please give me. Here's what I need. Here's what I'm telling you to do. And it sounds like we're, we're ordering off a menu. And I would encourage you, if you've gotten into a bad habit of coming in demanding that you start with, first of all, realizing who God is and spending some time reviewing that and let the, the gospel dwell in you richly and then, and then thank God for what he's already done. Spend some time expressing how grateful you are for what God has done because it's amazing. Just rethinking through what God has done changes your heart. It changes your motives. It changes your perspective. Instead of, what do I got to do today? It's like, oh God, after you've done so much for me, what do I want to do today? So those are some clues about how we start our time with God, about how we approach Him. And in fact, if you would look on, whether you're taking notes on the paper version or on the, if you're on our app, there's a, a, a kind of little sample way that you can spend time with God. And I just put down, like, focus on God for a couple of minutes Review what is true, and maybe that's your scripture that you've just read. Um, thank God. And then, then the next part is an identity moment. And so we come into the next part in Colossians 3, and he starts talking about not only how you set your mind, but how that then changes how you understand who you are. And it's very powerful what he says. He says, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So he says, where do you want to start on identity? I'll tell you where to start. Start with who you're not. He says, you used to identify yourself all kinds of ways. 
Let me, let me tell you, this is how it works in our culture right now. People are dividing up in little teams and they're fighting each other. I'm a man or I'm a woman or I'm an American, I'm a patriot or I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or, or I'm from uh, this part of the country and you're, you're from the city and I'm from the rural. We have so many ways in which we, we take these things that are true of us and we make them our identity and then we sort of judge people who are not part of that same identity. And if you think about what really happens when you invite Christ into your life, when, when you get baptized, it says, I died to all of that. I, I am a white American male at one level, but far, far more important is I belong to the King of Kings and my citizenship is in heaven and, and I'm a follower of Jesus. And the fact that what my gender is or what my color is or what my nationality is. In fact, I think it's a great thing. As I look through the messages I preach, one of the, sometimes I ask myself, can I preach this in Cambodia where they're under a communist government and they have uh, people who believe in all kinds of evil spirits all around them? And Because if it's true, it shouldn't be just American true. It should be true, true. It should be for any time in the world, any place in the world. And so... I think that helps us to expand our idea. He said, all those things that you used to identify yourself with, you died to that. That's old, that's gone. Yeah, it's still true at some levels, but that's not who you really are. And then he goes on and he says, who are you in Christ? And all the way through the scriptures, including here in Colossians, the the important thing is now that Christ has changed your life, he's made you a new person. And so, who is that new person? In verse 12, he says, here's your your motive. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. You find that all the way through the scriptures. He says, you know who you are? You're somebody that God chose. You're somebody that God, because of your relationship with Christ, he's declared you holy. He said, your sin is paid in full. You belong to me. You don't have to work hard to please me anymore. And then he says, oh yeah, and underneath it all, you're dearly loved. What what a difference it makes if you walk around with that understanding that I am loved. Pastor Jason said, you know, sometimes he, he feels like maybe God doesn't love him. And as I was reflecting about his message, I thought, I'm not sure I ever go there, but I think where I go is I think God loves me, but I don't think it's enough. That if his love was enough, then I wouldn't be so worried about these people liking me or how that person might think about me or what somebody says about me or some criticism I get. It wouldn't devastate me if I knew that God not only loved me, but his love was enough. And so what we've done in the past is we've kind of taken several times in our church history, we've taken different passages of scripture and we've said, we want to give you a practical way to remember who you are. And so when we were in the book of Ephesians, we actually handed out a bookmark, and it said, first side of it was, because God is, then I am. And we went through, I am loved, I am known, I am chosen, I am sealed. And uh, if you're using the Family Church app, um, there is a copy of it on there. You can actually download it for yourself, and then you'll just have it on your phone. And you can, you can spend some time thinking, This is who I am when your spiritual amnesia has taken you away from that. When you have forgotten that because of what Jesus does, because of what he did and what he is doing, I am a different person. Because listen carefully, you always act out of your identity. That's why you know when your identity is getting fuzzy is because you're responding in a way that isn't holy, isn't responding to God. You've gotten spiritual amnesia. And so we need to go back and we need to remember who I am and what happened. And, and I'm afraid that, that in all of this discussion, especially the, the division over the COVID, especially all of the, all of the ugly stuff that went on around the election, that sometimes we believe a false gospel. We believe that, that if we get the right person in the office, if we get the right people in power, if we get the right laws written, then that will save us. Let me tell you, a false gospel says the politics will save us, and it's not the truth. And even if you got the whole country 
to actually be obedient and do the right thing, and they had no relationship with Jesus, they would be just as lost as they are now. You see, that's a false gospel. The true gospel is that Jesus is the only answer. And when he saves me, I am absolutely changed. I am different than I was before. And so every day we need to review that and go over that and remember who we are. Because <laughs> overnight we've developed spiritual amnesia, and now I need to get my mind focused and straight again. And then the next part of what he talks about here in Colossians, but also the next part of how we spend a daily time with God, is practical holiness. Now this can be a little bit tricky to understand because you say, Paul, he just said we were holy. So isn't that enough? And there's, there's two kinds of the ways in which the Bible talks about holiness. One is that I am forgiven for all of my guilt, that Jesus took my sin when he died on the cross, and he has declared me holy so that when God looks at me, he sees me in all the goodness of Jesus. That is an incredible truth. However, in my mind and with my mouth and with my thoughts and with my activities, I am not there yet. I still sin. The Bible says we have a sin nature within us and there's this battle that goes on. So Jesus not only wants to save us and give us a relationship with God and make it so that we can go to heaven, there is a process called sanctification where God is working to make us more holy in our, our thoughts, in our heart, in our activities. That there is this practical holiness, and we have to participate in that, but it has to be by faith. I think the, the word sanctification is best described as like somebody that's washing the dishes. Like, I don't know if you do this, so maybe I'm getting myself in trouble, but I've been at people's houses where they're, they're eating their meal and they get all done with their food and then they put their plate down on the floor so the dog can lick the rest of it. And you always wonder when you're looking at the, your own plate, it's like, I wonder what happened to my plate before I ate off of it. And I, I don't know what happens to those plates in the meantime, but I hope they get sanctified first. That, that picture of Sanctification is really to be taken, to be washed, to be set aside, ready for use. So that's what God's doing in us. He's continually washing us and finding those places that we get dirty again and cleaning us up and making us ready for use so that the plate can be eaten on again. And that's a constant process. So how do I participate in that? And, and that's where some people take the wrong approach. What, what Colossians says is this. Since you've died, remember, Jesus took your life, you gave your life to him. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. So part of setting your heart and mind, he says, I remember that's not who I am. That's not what I do anymore. But then he goes on and he says there's this active part of saying, okay, that's not okay anymore. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Listen carefully. He's saying, that's not who you are anymore, so quit acting like that. But I've got to have that clarity in my mind that says, that's right. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. That's right. Lust is an empty, empty way of trying to live, and only Christ gives us contentment. That greed, and, and he actually kind of digs down to a little deeper level. He says, don't get involved in greed, the wanting of more physical stuff, he says, which is idolatry? Wow, that sounds worse. I mean, if I wish I had a new car and I focus on that, that doesn't sound that bad. If he says, that's just like bowing down in front of an idol, well, that makes it sound worse. And I, and I think that what we do in spending time with God is he helps make sin sinful. You know, you and I have kind of an ambivalent relationship with sin. Some of it we hate and some of it we love and some of it we just don't care about. And to God, it's all awful. And as we spend time with God, we begin to say, boy, that's not what I want to be like. That's not who, I mean, that is not who I am, so that's not what I want to act like. And then he goes on in verse 8, and he says, but now, they've made some progress in getting rid of some of the other stuff. Now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices. In other words, 
you died to that. It no longer is who you really are, but there's still a lot of bad habits. And we still get tempted and we still slip in what we say. And oh, man, bitterness and anger and resentment. Man, I can go from having my quiet time and being so connected to God to being irritated in such a short time. And maybe you can too. And so he says, I want you to spend some time. And I believe that in the morning, one of the things that we need to do is to say, God, I want you to examine my heart. Sometimes I come to God and I feel shamed. I feel sinful. I know that I said some things I shouldn't have. I know that I got involved in some thought life that wasn't right. So I'm, I'm clear about sins to confess. But sometimes it's been a pretty good day, a pretty good stretch, and I, I don't really know what to confess. And I hope that confession is, is a normal part of your time with God. In fact, I encourage you as we go through this, this list of what to do to spend a few moments, spend a couple of minutes just in confession. And I want to suggest that you take a moment to listen. Uh, Pastor Will, several months ago, started talking about that when we pray, we don't always know what to pray about. And he said, what if we stopped in our prayer and said, okay, God, what do you want me to pray about? And that was a new thought for me. I, I, I come in with a whole lot of things that I'm concerned about, a whole lot of people that are going through really hard things, and, and I come in with like a dump truck ready to, lo- ready to just dump it in front of Jesus. And yet I had to admit, you know, I don't always know what to pray for. I, I, I don't know what they need. I don't know what God's doing in them. And, and it's been an interesting experiment to just slow down and say, God, what do you want me to pray? And so let me apply this to this idea of confession. What if you come in and maybe you confess some things you know were wrong and then you say, Lord, is there anything else? <laughs> it's, one, it's one of the things we do in marriage team that builds that communication that says, is there anything else? And just wait. Stay silent before God for a moment. And, and sometimes God brings up somebody that you that, that anger is built up again or somebody that, that you need to forgive or maybe somebody that you're avoiding and it gives you a chance to then confess. And what, what confess means is just agree with God. You say, yep, that's, that's sinful. That's wrong. That's ugly. And here's the secret. The dish cannot wash itself. If you think of the dish as animate, you would say, the dish just has to say to the dishwasher, here I am. I'm available. Scrub me clean. Make me usable. And so we need to learn to confess deeply. Not only confess things that we did wrong, but confess things that God points out in our hearts. And, and sometimes as you mature, you even begin to say, why am I so easily angered? Why do I feel so insecure? And quite often it has to do because I don't believe the gospel at some level. I don't believe that God loves me and that that's enough. I don't believe that my sin is really forgiven. I don't believe that the power of Christ is available to me right now. And so as we confess, go beyond just the surface of activities and maybe even between thoughts and and down to what the root of it might be. And if you do that, that'll be a part of God cleaning up your life so that your outside matches your inside. That's what we call transformation. And then as you move on, and we often think of this as the prayer request section of our time, and plans for the day, people I know about, and Let me just challenge you to do two things. One, to start with, pray for myself. That instead of saying, here's a bunch of other people, be very personal. And and specifically, I was looking in this chapter, what are some clues of what do we pray for ourselves? And he says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself. So we've taken off, we've counted to dead, as dead, the sinful things. Now, Put on, like you're putting on a a set of clothes, yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. (laughs) I don't know anybody that has enough of those. So you say, okay, God, I can't do this myself by faith in you. Give me your humility, your gentleness. And and these are called the fruits of the Spirit, if you think about it, that, that as the Spirit fills us and as we allow Him to control our mindset and our heart set, then these things become more natural to our activities, to our relationships. So start off by saying, 
Lord, I want you, would you do this in me? And again, it's not just try harder. It's not like I try to be more patient. It's, God, I am not patient. Please give me your patience. Please give me your perspective. And then he says, I want you to, then as you go through that, he will also begin to change your ideas. I wake up with a to-do list clicking on my mind pretty quick. Oh, I should do this, and I should do this, and I should do this. And, and I'm a morning energy kind of person. And I think if we do this, it'll change from a to-do list to a to-be list. God, what do you want me to be today? How am I going to be your hands and feet as I go to work, as I go to school, as, I, as I'm involved in the neighborhood? Help me, Lord, to be full of compassion, to listen to people, to hear what's really going on. And then as you've prayed for yourself, then it leads you naturally to be praying for others. How do I pray not only for the needs of people I care about and love, and I, I'm, not, I'm not making light of that. I think that's what most of our prayer tends to focus on. And that's not wrong. I just think there's some other things that we could pray for. And so as he gives us clues in this chapter, he goes on and he says, bear with each other. <laughs> so you're thinking about, okay, I'm going through my day and oh, I'm going to have to deal with them. Oh, we're going to have to talk about that. And instead of being the conflict looking for a place to happen, you say, okay, God, give me a heart of compassion and humility. It says, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Okay, God, that's right. I've been forgiven. I've been healed. Your power is now available for me to love people. In fact, that's, that's how he ends this. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. He says, if you want to know what's going to be the bow that ties this all up, it really is love. All of these things we're talking about is learning to love God, learning to love other people. And here's a a radical suggestion. It came up in in the book we read that uh, spiritually healthy, emotionally healthy spirituality. And he talks about what he calls the daily office. Because if I spend a great time with God and I really focus on Him, (laughs) that's going to maybe last me till 10 o'clock. And he says there should be maybe several points through the day. Instead of trying to do it all in the morning, maybe I have some scheduled points in the day where I stop and refocus. In fact, if you've gotten that pause app that several people have mentioned, I've I've got it on my watch and it just jumps up and it says, take one minute. And it's got a very simple phrase. It says, God, I give everything and everyone to you right now. And it's been a long time since 6.30 in the morning when you read it for the first time. And now God says, remember who you are, remember who I am, remember how we are going to do this. And again, you surrender and you let God work in you. So my challenge to you, whether you're watching online or you're watching uh, at one of the campuses, is that you take an intentional plan to look at your quiet time, how you spend time with God, and begin to do something to shake that up. Maybe you don't have a plan and you need, you need to make a plan. And I, I've given you some kind of basic outlines of how to start on that. Maybe you've been doing the same thing for a long time and you need some way to refresh it. Or, or maybe there's some things that we've suggested out of Colossians 3 that would make it richer and deeper and more life-changing. But I guarantee you, spending time on your relationship with God is not only worth it, it is transforming. Thanks for listening.